Good morning. We have general questions. Question one from James Kelly has been withdrawn. Uh, I have an explanation that I'm satisfied with. Question two, Jane Baxter. To ask, the Scottish, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with the implementation of the Town Centre First principle. Minister Marco Biaggi. We will produce an update on progress with the Town Centre Action Plan in due course. This will include an update on the implementation of the Town Centre First principle, as well as the other wide-ranging actions stemming from the plan. Jane Baxter. I thank the Minister for that answer. Given that there is all party support in Dunfermline for the relocation of Fife College to Dunfermline Town Centre, does he agree with me that Fife College must examine this option and should publish all the details of the business case relating to each site being considered before any decision is made? Minister. Uh, well, the Town Centre First Principle applies to public bodies and uh, the Principle does request that decisions are taken that put the health of town centres at the heart of decision making. The principle, though, recognises that town centres aren't always the most suitable location for services, but asks that they are considered first and for transparency in the decision-making process. There can be reasons not to locate in town centres, but I would emphasise that they must be good reasons and explained. Margaret McCulloch. Thank you, President Officer. Um, as the convener of the cross-party group for towns and town centres, I was at an event where you attended last Wednesday for Scotland's Towns Partnerships, and you said you would be happy to meet with anybody regarding town centres. Would you meet with um, the council, who are active in actually trying to keep the college in Dunfermline, and discuss it with them? Mr. Uh, I would be happy to meet with uh, Fife Council on issues of uh, town centre regeneration or, or any other issues that they wish to raise. I last met them uh, some months ago on another issue and I would always be happy to meet a uh, local authority to discuss matters of importance to them. Question number three, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the incidence of knife crime in North Ayrshire compares now with 2007. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the number of crimes of handling offensive weapons, which include knife uh, crime recorded in North Ayrshire, has decreased by a massive 85 per cent since 2006-07. Uh, this success is down to the local partnership making a real difference and shows that we are going in the right direction for North Ayrshire. We are making progress in other parts of Scotland too. Violent crime is at its lowest level uh, for 41 years, and since 2006-07, uh, crimes for handling an offensive weapon has fallen by 67 per cent nationally. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Justice Secretary for that encouraging answer. Although there is no room for complacency, it is reassuring for the people of North Ayrshire to know that under this SNP government, knife crime in North Ayrshire has fallen by a whopping 85 per cent. Can the Justice Secretary tell us what part of the No Knives, Better Lives campaign has played in educating young people about the risks and consequences of carrying a knife? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the No Nice Better Life programme has been delivered and developed locally in North Ayrshire since 2012. Uh, partners include uh, Youth Services, Education, Police Scotland, ACE, uh, Voluntary Groups, uh, NHS, uh, Youth Justice and KA Leisure. And this partnership has been absolutely key in developing the foundation and creating a positive shift uh, around uh, carrying uh, weapons such as knives in the area of North Ayrshire. There is also a dedicated team of campus officers delivering the No Knives Better Lives workshops in schools and colleges across uh, Ayrshire. Uh, and Ayrshire Community Education and Sports have visited some 32 primary schools and three secondary schools, as well as visited six problematic areas. And they are continuing to provide programmes in schools in warning uh, about the risks of carrying offensive weapons. Question number four, Lewis MacDonald. The Scottish Government. To ask the Scottish Government how many jobs have been lost at Young's seafood processing plant in Fraserburgh and how many remain at risk. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, when Young's seafood commenced the consultation process regarding its site in Fraserburgh in July, the company employed 580 people. At the end of October, the company employed 534 people. The reduction of 46 was fully attributable to resignations. Since the end of October, 15 employees have been issued with notice of redundancy and left the business in November. The company has informed their joint consultative group that they expect to issue 152 employees with notice of redundancy in January and, based on present employee numbers, to issue a further 130 employees with a notice in May. 
This would leave the company with 238 employees post May 2016, and the final numbers will be dependent upon transition decisions and customer demand. In July, Staff Force, the temporary employment labour agency, had 377 agency placements with the company, which reduced to 210 by the end of October 2015. Lewis MacDonald. The Secretary for that answer. He will be aware of reports that some of Sainsbury's Scottish salmon is now being processed in Poland and other countries because the company which won Sainsbury's Scottish salmon supply contract has failed to deliver. Will ministers look into these reports and meet Sainsbury's as a matter of urgency? Will they stand up for the hundreds of Scot North East workers facing redundancy uh, early in the new year and press Sainsbury's to give these workers hope for the future instead of exporting their jobs? Cabinet Secretary. As Mr Macdonald will know, the Scottish Government at all times acts to protect employment within Scotland and <laughs> we have been actively involved in uh, all of the discussions about uh, trying to preserve and to protect employment within Fraserburgh. Uh, I certainly will ensure that the reports to which Mr Macdonald refers are looked into and that any relevant issues are raised with Sainsbury. Uh, the Rural Affairs and Fisheries Secretary Richard Lockhead regularly engages with the uh, supermarkets as part of his wider responsibilities on uh, supporting the development of the food sector in Scotland. And of course, uh, Mr Lockhead has been uh, very successful at encouraging supermarkets to, to uh, produce and uh, retail produce from Scotland, uh, which has had a significant benefit on the sustainability of many companies in Scotland. And I can see no good reason why um, companies cannot see the advantage of working with a, a plant such as Young's at Fraserburgh. Christian Allard. Thank you very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I would like to know uh, if the task force which is in place is looking at relocating and helping phone jobs at the vibrant, for the vibrant committee of small and medium food processors based in Fraserburgh and based in Peterhead as well, making sure that we've got that sustainability that we require for these fishing communities. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, Mr Allard makes a, a very strong point in that there has been an emergence uh, in recent years of a whole range of small and medium-sized food operators within Scotland. It's in fact one of the great strengths of the food and drink sector that uh, has been advanced in the promotional work by the Rural Affairs Secretary. Uh, so I, I think the, the task force will undoubtedly look at the opportunity that Mr Allard raises um, and the difficulties that have faced the workforce at Young's uh, will undoubtedly provide an opportunity to address some of those difficulties by the other employment opportunities that will exist in other processors. Question number five, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing and what funds it has allocated to make care more attractive career choice for men and young people. Cabinet Secretary, Gunnar Robinson. Uh, recruitment, retention and development of career pathways in the social services sector is a key area of action within the vision and strategy for social services published earlier this year. The SSSC has produced a number of different resources to support those looking to recruit staff and for those looking at a career in the care sector. A key resource is the Ambassadors for Careers in Care scheme. These ambassadors are staff who currently work in the sector, who attend events, visit schools and careers fairs to promote careers in the sector, and there are currently 100 of those. Uh, finally, earlier this year, we provided funding of £10 million per year as part of a tripartite arrangement with local authorities and providers uh, of care worth £20 million to improve the quality of care in care homes for older people as part of our wider approach to tackle issues of recruitment and retention in the sector. Rhoda Grant. <coughs> I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary last month asking her to meet my constituents who are GMB members and have real concerns about pay conditions and job security of care workers, issues that make careers in caring very unattractive. She turned that request down that request, saying she was too busy to meet them. How on earth is the Cabinet Secretary going to deal with the crisis in the care service if she won't even listen to the views of the people that are working at the coal face? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I say to Rhoda Grant that I certainly do listen to the views of those and uh, the co-face I meet regularly with uh, staff from not just the, the health side but the care side as well. And of course, we continue to discuss with COSLA and the sector what more can be done uh, to improve pay and conditions 
uh, in the sector. I'm certainly more than willing to um, look at the request for a meeting with the, the GMB, but you know, Rhoda Grant should be assured that this is a key priority for us. Um, and you know, I'm very uh, happy to engage with staff on the front line as I continue to do. Alex Shirley. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Minister recognise that low pay is a major barrier for recruitment and retention in the sector? And is she willing to look at the Government's role in introducing a living wage across the care sector, as that would seem to be the correct way to move forward? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I'm sure, as Alex Riley is already aware, uh, we have and continue to give this issue uh, our full attention. Some progress has been made, so the guidance that was published uh, on the 6th of October makes clear that the Scottish Government sees the payment of the living wage to be a significant indicator of an employer's commitment to fair work practices, and it's one of the clearest ways an employer can demonstrate that it takes a positive approach to the workforce. Also, in addition to the £20 million deal with the care home sector, we continue to discuss with that sector and the care at home sector with COSLA what progress we can make towards the living wage uh, as quickly as possible. What we must do within that, though, is to also protect capacity within the sector and make sure that the progress we make can be, make, can be at a pace but also protects the capacity within the sector. Those discussions are ongoing and I'm happy to keep the member uh, updated as we move forward with them. Question number six in the name of Patricia Ferguson has not been lodged. The member has provided an explanation that I am satisfied with. Question number seven, Alex Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government whether, in the light of reported evidence of inj injury to working dogs, it will revoke the ban on tail docking in breeds that have traditionally been docked for their own protection and safety. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. As the member will be aware, I recently wrote to the Rural Affairs Committee explaining that the case has been made to the government that it could be possible to introduce a tightly defined exemption regime in Scotland that would allow vets to exercise their professional judgment to dock specific breeds. As such, the government has indicated a willingness to formally consult to ascertain whether there is wider support for such a course of action, and I will shortly write to the Rural Affairs Committee to clarify our proposed course of action. Alex Johnson. The Minister will be fully aware that there are divided opinions on this matter, but those who are involved in, the hunting, uh, in hunting in Scotland are also only too aware of the injuries that can occur to working dogs, particularly during this season. With MSPs now being uh, inundated with photographs of injuries that have taken place, uh, will the Minister uh, undertake to make as many moves as possible to ensure that this change is made in order to avoid this problem in the future? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, believe me, I am very well aware that there is divided opinion in Scotland on this very sensitive issue. Uh, we do believe there is a possible case to allow docking of spaniels, for instance, and hunt point retrievers that are likely to be used as working dogs only and allow removal of the end of the third tail only, as the research evidence found that there was no additional benefit in reducing injury uh, by shortening tails more than that. But we do have to strike that balance, of course, between protecting the welfare of puppies and of adult working dogs. And these are very difficult issues. If we do proceed to consultation, as I indicated, it will be a genuine consultation. And Alec Johnson and other members, and most importantly, of course, the relevant communities, will have the opportunity to have that debate and submit their views. Uh, and we'll take forward that issue in a, in a serious manner. Question number eight, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that planning applications and their associated documents are easy to understand. Mark Biaggi. The larger or more complex the planning proposal, the greater the complexity and volume of information submitted is likely to be. Consequently, some planning applications may be more difficult to understand than others. Cameron Buchanan. <clears throat> thank you, Presiding Thank you. I thank the Minister's response. It is all too common to think that placing a lot of documents in a corner of a local authority's website counts as transparency. It does not, especially when some residents have to hire planning experts to analyse these documents. So what assurances can the Scottish Government give that the community's desire for open planning processes will be met with genuine clarity rather than just a box-ticking exercise? Minister. I would emphasise the importance that we do place on engagement very early. One of the core values is set out 
that uh, it should be inclusive, engaging all interests as early and effectively as possible. This is picked up in our guidance and on planning application procedures through Circular 3 2013. Planning Advice Note 3 2010 on community engagement also recognises the variety of methods of engagement, the importance of the approach adopted suiting the scale and impact of the project, the people participating, the particular situation, and applicants for national and major developments must comply with requirements for pre-application consultation with communities. That includes a public event, newspaper advertising, details of how to make written submission to the applicant. And planning authorities can require additional consultation measures in such cases. The current review of the Scottish planning system has identified community engagement and streamlining all of this processes as two of its six key issues. The independent review panel's call for evidence closes on the 1st of December. So if the member hasn't already responded, perhaps you would like to. Question number nine, Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with universities regarding the Higher Education Governance Scotland Bill. Cabinet Secretary Andrew Conson. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government officials have met with representatives of our universities on several occasions in the last few months. I myself met with key higher education stakeholders, including Universities Scotland and the Rector of the University of Edinburgh on the 4th of November to discuss the Higher Education Governance Scotland Bill. And I also met with Anne Richards, uh, Vice Chair of Court at the University of Edinburgh on the 2nd of November to discuss the bill also. Question number you, Sorry, Jim Eady. For that answer, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the size of the Senate in our universities should be proportionate to the size of the university itself? And as such, a one-size-fits-all approach does not meet the needs of institutions like the world-leading University of Edinburgh. Given this, will she, in the spirit of reasonableness for which she is renowned, agree <laughs> to look again at this issue? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the 2012 von Prinsinski Review of Higher Education Governance uh, recommended that an academic board should feature no more than 120 members. And the recommendations in that very wide-ranging uh, report have informed the provisions that are in the Bill. However, I remain open-minded on the final form of the provisions uh, that are uh, currently in the Bill. The Scottish Government, as Mr Eady knows, is currently considering the, the evidence uh, put to the Education and Culture Committee on this uh, very specific point. Uh, and therefore, I can reassure Mr Eady that we will consider the matter very carefully. Question number 10, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I ask the Scottish Government whether it anticipates any public order issues arising from so-called Black Friday events being run by retailers? Minister Paul Wheelhouse. At Christmas are not new and are an important part of the retail offering at this time of year. However, the importation of the concept of Black Friday from beyond our shores and the hype that goes with it is a new phenomenon and, as the member will be aware, resulted in some very irresponsible behaviour and quite disgraceful scenes last year, including scenes of physical violence uh, towards staff and other shoppers. While it is not for the Scottish Government uh, to dictate the practices of retailers in terms of how and when they choose to promote certain products, we fully expect that retailers uh, will take whatever steps are necessary to ensure the safety of their staff and customers and to encourage responsible behaviour. I am confident that retailers are fully aware of the events of last year and that every effort will be made to ensure those are not repeated. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm pleased to see that some retailers have decided not to participate in these events this year, but others are going ahead in this recent innovation, which does seem deliberately designed to whip customers up into a frenzy of aggression uh, and, in some cases, violence. Will the Scottish Government hold retailers accountable if any issues do arise in relation to public order or public safety as a result of this very deliberate new innovation? Minister. Uh, well, I, would, I would certainly repeat the point. I think retailers do have a responsibility to look after the safety of their staff and indeed their, their customers. And, uh, uh, but I would say I would commend the work of USDO as the trade union representing shop workers, their, their work on Freedom for, uh, from Fear campaign, uh, which is very welcome. And indeed, we had recently a debate that celebrated the Respect for Shop Workers Week. Uh, the Scottish Res Business Resilience Centre is also doing uh, important work with Police Scotland to ensure through a violence reduction handbook that 20,000 copies have been issued to retailers across 
across Scotland to ensure they are aware of their responsibilities to, to their staff and indeed their customers and to encourage good practice. And that has been widely, widely shared. And indeed, I believe that the Scottish Retail Consortium also recognise the, uh, the, the value of advice from Police Scotland and is taking this issue very seriously this year. So I give the member the assurance I will keep an eye on it, but I do believe the retail sector is taking the responsibilities very seriously. Thank you. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery Mr Abdul Kudus Bejenjo, Speaker of the Pakistani Provincial Assembly of Balakistan. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, 